Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm happy to host Tomer Galanti. Tomer is a PhD candidate at the School of Computer Science at Tel Aviv University. Uh, he is working with Professor Leah Wolf, mainly focusing on the intersection between theory and algorithm deep learning. Uh, today we'll talk, uh, he will tell us about the modularity and optimization of uh, dynamic, sorry, <laughs> oh, the modularity and optimization dynamics of hyper networks. So, Tomer, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, yes, I'm Tomer Galanti and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I hope everyone is uh, well. So, I'll talk about the modularity and optimization dynamics of hyper networks. Uh, and these slides are based on the following two publications. Um, so I'll start by talking about the modularity of hypernetworks of what we call uh, modularity and then about the uh, optimization dynamics of them. So let's start with a problem setup. So it is very simple. We would like to learn or approximate some Talit function Y with two inputs. The first one, uh, uh, X, is typically an image, which is high dimensional. And the second one, Z, is typically an index that is associated with the image, which is low dimensional. So we can think about these functions in, in two different ways. The first one is simply as a standard function uh, representation, where we have a function that takes the two inputs and returns the output of it. And the second way to think about such functions is as high order functions, where we have a decomposition into two main components, where the first one is a mapping F from uh, the space of images to a space of functions. So we have a mapping from an image to a function that is specified by that image. And the, the function Y of X is a mapping from Z to, to the output space. So it maps Z to Y of X and Z. Okay, so we have this hierarchical um, representation of our function. And this setting can be applied to uh, many different problems and tasks of interest. For example, it can be applied uh, for uh, solving super resolution where X is an image and Z consists of a specific location. So it is a set of coordinates within the image. And the function Y takes the two inputs and returns the uh, value of uh, uh, the uh, high quality version of X at the position Z. So for example, we can think about uh, the example in the slide, we have X being the image on the left-hand side and we have uh, X tilde being the uh, high quality version of it. And the function Y takes uh, the image X and the specific location and returns the value of X tilde at that position um, given X. Okay, so, so this is a, a simple uh, use case that we can think of. So we're interested on um, understanding what is the most effective way in order uh, in, in modeling high order functions. So what is the most effective uh, uh, way to model functions in uh, as as high order functions? So there are multiple ways to to think about it and, and to model such functions. And the most intuitive way uh, is probably to use an embedding method which is <clears throat> a very simple model. It has two main components. The first one is uh, a neural network, G, that takes uh, the concatenation of an encoding of the image and uh, uh, the uh, coordinates as its input. So it takes the concatenation and returns the output of the model. So we have a neural network with uh, a concatenated input and the encoding of the image can be extracted in many different ways. And a very simple way to do that is to simply pre-train or train along this ne uh, network an autoencoder uh, and, and to take the bottleneck layer as the embedding representation of the images. Okay, and, and we take the uh, embedding 
of the image from the bottleneck and concatenate it with uh, the indices such that the second network takes it as its input. And the second way to model such functions is to use what is called a hypernetwork. So a hypernetwork is a model that has two, uh, two, two components as well. So we have uh, one neural network F that takes the image as its input and it generates a long vector of weights as its output. Okay, so we have a mapping from images to weights and these weights are being plugged into uh, a second neural network G uh, that takes the second input Z as its input and returns the output of the model. Okay, so we have one component that is a mapping from images to weights and the second component has no trainable parameters uh, G whose weights are conditioned on, on the input of X and maps Z to outputs. So we can think about F as a mapping from images to functions because it specifies a specific function within the class of, of G. So basically we have two different ways to model this problem. We have the embedding method and we have the hyper network. And basically the main difference between the two is in the way that we uh, provide the primary network, uh, the embedding of X as its input. So the primary in the case of the hyper network is G is the uh, neural network that takes uh, the weights from F. And in the embedding method, it is the neural network on, on the top that takes the concatenation as its input. So uh, the uh, way in which we provide the embedding of X uh, varies between the two models. And the main quest question that we uh, would like to uh, answer or, or target uh, uh, in the first paper, in the first part, is which kind of modeling as high order functions is more effective? And specifically to be a bit more formal, uh, which model would achieve lower approximation or when fixing the parameter complexity of the primary network? Okay, so we fix the, the top part, okay? And we allow the embedding function to be a large. Um, and we would like to know which one is able to achieve uh, a better approximation error with respect to target functions. So just uh, for clarity, I am sure that most of us uh, know uh, what is uh, the definition of an approximation error, but for clarity, uh, we have uh, a parametric model G with uh, input Z and varying parameters theta. And we have some target function Y that we would like to approximate. So the approximation error of G with respect to Y is simply the infimum over the selection of theta of the distance between uh, G with parameters theta and the target function Y, okay, in, in L infinity. So this is not ours. This is just to provide some context, a well-known result on approximating uh, uh, R-smooth functions. So we have an R-smooth function Y uh, and and uh, then there is a neural network G that uh, achieves an approximation error at most epsilon in approximating uh, Y, such that the parameter complexity of G is upper bounded by epsilon to the minus the dimension of Z uh, divided by R. So, uh, and here Z is the input of, of, uh, of Y. Okay, so basically as long as we want the approximation error to be smaller, then we need to uh, provide a larger neural network in order to approximate Y. And if the input dimension is larger, then uh, the complexities ought to be larger as well. But if we know that Y has uh, higher order derivatives, then uh, we are able to uh, provide a smaller neural network in order to approximate Y. And this has been proven for both, uh, both neural networks with smooth activations and with uh, relu activations. So what is our result, the first one? Um, we claim that if we have uh, 
a, a function y that is R smooth. Uh, then there is a hypernetwork H that achieves an approximation L at most epsilon in approximating y, uh, such that the parameter complexity of the primary network is upper bounded by epsilon to the minus the dimension of z divided by r. Okay, so basically we are able to approximate all of the functions yx uh, altogether uh, instead of individually as we had in the previous slide. Okay, so we uh, don't lose in, in the complexity for approximating them in, in, uh, in this way. Um, what the, I, I got a question here in the chat, dim z is intrinsic, intrinsic dimension, what does it mean? So is that the, the raw dimension of the input or the intrinsic dimension of the input? What do you mean by raw dimension? Like, you know, the height and width of the picture image in the super resolution uh, example, or, you know, the actual uh, dimension of the you mean, uh, lower if, rank? If, if it can be embedded in a lower dimensional space? Yeah, so there's an intrinsic dimension for images, for instance, or anything on the on the that exists on the lower rank manifold. Yes, so we simply assume that the inputs are taking taken from uh, minus one to one uh, to uh, the dimension. So basically, you are unable to uh, to embed it in a lower dimension without losing, uh, like without being. Uh, in, in a lossless way. Um, so, so this is the assumption. So basically you can basically think of it as the intrinsic, the intrin, intrinsic di, dimension, yeah. Okay, so basically uh, in, in the previous slide, we had, um, we had the worst case uh, upper bound, but we can think about cases where uh, the, um, the complexity for approximating the functions y of x um, is uh, is smaller than than the worst case uh, upper bound. So in, in this case, uh, the hypernetwork is uh, able to match uh, the complexity as well. So for example, if we denote by C S H epsilon of y x the minimal uh, parameter complexity of a shallow neural network that approximates uh, uh, the, uh, the, the functions y, x up to an approximation L or epsilon, then there is a hypernetwork that achieves an approximation L at most epsilon in approximating y, such that the parameter complexity of G is upper bounded by the maximal value of these uh, quantities. So basically we um, were able to match uh, the approximation um, capacity uh, in this case as well. So in order to, to say that the hyper networks are in some way in advantage here, we have to compare them uh, to, to the alternative. So uh, for, for the embedding method, we're able to show that if we have a bounded embedding dimension and the model achieves an approximation error at most epsilon, uh, in approximating continuously differentiable functions, then the parameter complexity of the primary is owed to be at least epsilon to the minus the dimension of z plus the dimension of x. So in this case, we have a dependence on the dimension of x, which makes it uh, significantly larger than we had with the hypernetworks. So we have um, something that is not as effective as the previous case. And in the case where we relax the, the assumption on the boundness and we have an unbounded embedding dimension, we still have um, something that is larger than the case of the hypernetworks. And we uh, have something that is owed to be at least epsilon to the minus the dimension of Z plus the, sum, uh, the minimal value between uh, the dimension of Z and the dimension of X. So now it still has a dependence on the dimension of X. It is a weaker dependence, but if we, for example, consider the case where the dimension of Z is smaller than the dimension of X, then we have something that is 
uh, quadratic in, in the uh, size uh, of, of the previous case. Okay, so to summarize, um, if we want to approximate each function individually using a neural network, we need uh, something about epsilon to the minus the dimension of Z. Uh, with the hyper network, we have the same capacity, uh, but we are able to approximate them all together. And with the embedding method with a bounded embedding dimension or unbounded embedding dimension, uh, we need to take a, a much larger neural network as the primary. Um, so in the previous part, we have shown that in terms of expressivity, <clears throat> uh, the primary network G can be relatively small. Um, so as a next step, we, uh, we would like to show that G must be shallow in order to effectively optimize the hyper network. Okay. So it is in some sense complementary to the previous argument. Um, so before I, I discuss um, the results that we have, uh, I would like to, uh, to do some background on, on NTK theory, specifically on the analysis of Li and Chao um, for neural networks optimization via gradient flow. So we have uh, an MLP. H, uh, a time T with uh, weights WT. So I'll define the dynamics of WT in advance, in two slides. Uh, this neural network is of width N um, and it is initialized with a vector whose coordinates are IID, standard normally distributed. And we have a one over square root of N normalization in each layer. So we consider a standard loss function. This is the L2, for example, which is convex with respect to the outputs, but not with respect to uh, the trainable parameters. And the optimization dynamics of WT are given by the following uh, differential equation. So we have um, the derivative of WT with respect to time is simply um, minus uh, uh, the learning rate multiplied by the gradient of the loss function with respect to, to W, to the weights, uh, which can be uh, uh, written by the chain rule uh, in the following manner. So we have the multiplication between uh, the gradient of, of uh, the uh, output of the model with respect to uh, W multiplied by the derivative of the loss function with respect to the output of, of the model. And again, by the chain rule, we are also able to, um, to have an equation for the uh, dynamics of the output of the model. Okay, so uh, this is simply given by the uh, gradient of the model with respect to uh, W uh, multiplied by uh, the derivative of uh, the um, weights with respect to time, okay? And uh, by the previous slide, we can, uh, we can plug in the formula for the uh, derivative of W with respect to time and have the following equation. And uh, the, uh, the term in the middle, the product in the middle um, is called the, uh, the NTK at time t, uh, which is simply um, a large matrix of the number of samples on the number of samples where each coordinate is simply a dot product between uh, the gradient of the model uh, at time t with respect to the weights, okay, at different um, for a different samples. So we have xi and xj. And we can also consider the first order Taylor approximation of the model with respect to uh, the weights. So this is called the linearization of the model. And it is simply given by um, the sum of the model at initialization. Uh, so w0 plus uh, the gradient of the model with respect to W at position zero multiplied by 
uh, the difference between uh, W and W0, okay? And we have the same loss function, but in this case, uh, the function is convex with respect to W, okay? Because the linearization, even though it is a nonlinear function with respect to X, it is a linear function with respect to W, here WT, okay? So we have something that is linear with respect to W, but not with respect to the input X. And the optimization dynamics are uh, very similar, uh, but instead um, we have that uh, the gradient of the model is not at time T, it is at time zero here. Uh, this is simply because uh, this quantity is fixed over time. And the dynamics of uh, the output of the linearization is the same, but with uh, the kernel at time zero. And uh, the linearization can be shown uh, to converge to uh, a solution uh, of a kernel regression uh, where the feature map is uh, the gradient of the model at initialization. Um, and the kernel is the, the anti-kernel at, uh, at initialization. So this is the K0. And basically what they show in the paper is that if we have a neural network H of width N and we apply gradient descent with a small enough learning rate, uh, then the distance between our uh, neural network at time t and its linearization at time t uh, is upper bounded by one over the square root of uh, the width. Okay, so as long as the width uh, tends to be very large, then our neural network behaves very similarly to uh, its linearization. So uh, what about hypernetworks? So, um, so we are interested in, in studying uh, large width regimes of hypernetworks. Does it mimic the uh, linearization or not? Do we have such correspondences? So um, we fix the inputs X and Z and we consider the Taylor expansion of the model's output at uh, the first uh, iteration or after one iteration of SGD. Okay, so we have W1 equals W0 minus the step, and we expand it around uh, the initialization, W0. Okay, so uh, the Taylor expansion of our model can be simply written uh, in the following manner. We have uh, the series R from zero to infinity, and we have the product of uh, the uh, derivative of the model at initialization out times with respect to W uh, multiplied by um, the difference between uh, W1 and uh, W0 to R. Okay, so uh, this is just an extension to, to multi-dimensions. Uh, so we have an R rank tensor uh, for the gradient, for the R gradient, and we have R times product of a vector, which uh, also uh, gives us uh, an R rank tensor. And basically the first two terms of the, the, the expansion is the linearization uh, of, the, of the model after one iteration of SGD. And we have the rest of the, uh, the series. Okay, so we know from, um, from uh, the the analysis of Lee and Chao that uh, in the case of neural networks, uh, this series should uh, uh, tend to zero as the width tends to infinity, okay, which gives us the correspondence between the uh, neural network and its linearization. Uh, so we would like to study uh, these uh, series. So basically, um, we can take the gradient of the loss function and using the, um, the chain rule, we can represent it as uh, the, uh, 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 the gradient of uh, the loss with respect to uh, the output of the model uh, multiplied by the gradient of the model. So uh, this term is simply can 
can be simply treated as a constant. So we are interested in these KJRs, which are defined here. So these are the gradient, uh, the, the rth um, uh, gradient of the model uh, multiplied by uh, the gradient of the model uh, to r. So uh, what we show is that if, if we have um, we have a hyper network with ReLU activations um, where the width of F is denoted by N and the depth of G uh, is denoted by D, uh, which is of a constant width. Okay, so the primary is, is of a constant width. Uh, we have a large width uh, hyper part. The, uh, the embedding function is, is uh, very wide. Um, and we, we, we look at the depth of, of the primary, then uh, these KJRs scale uh, as follows. So for R larger than the depth, we have something that is of order one over N to the R minus D. And for all that is smaller than D, uh, we have something that is uh, uh, simply a random variable. Okay, so we have constants. These are non-vanishing as a function of n. Okay, so uh, we don't have the correspondence as we had earlier when uh, g is of a constant width. Um, and basically, as long as the depth of g is larger, then we have uh, a larger discrepancy between uh, the model and its linearization. And in the dually infinite regime, when both F and G are of infinite width, uh, the dynamics uh, becomes convex again. So we have the correspondence. So uh, there is um, this uh, phase that we, we don't study in this paper where uh, we, we have the combination of the two. In, in the first case, we assume constancy uh, so we can also add it as a, the, the width of G as a variable and see what, what are the trade-offs, uh, which is interesting. Um, so to, to validate these ideas, uh, basically we conducted several experiments uh, to see uh, the different trade-offs between the depth and, and the width um, of, of G, <clears throat> of the primary. Uh, so we consider the task of uh, very simple task of, of MNIST and CIFAR 10 rotations prediction. So we have F uh, provided with uh, an image and G provided with a rotated version of that image. And we would like to predict what is the, uh, the angle of the second image uh, with respect to the first image. Okay, and F as a fixed, uh, depth four and width uh, 200 and uh, and we play with uh, the depth and and the width of g okay so um in the first column we have uh, g being of depth three and in the second one it is of depth uh, six and in the third one it is eight and we also vary the width of of g being 50 100 and 200 and as we can see, uh, when, when uh, G is, is, uh, is wider and shallower, then the uh, optimization dynamics are uh, much, it, it trains much faster and, and, and converges uh, to, to better positions. Um, and, and, and basically, and, and lately I've been conducting uh, more experiments on, on that with additional tasks. And it seems uh, very consistent for different uh, optimizers and, and, and as well, which is not something that we don't study here and also like learning different learning grades. So this is very consistent. Um, yeah, as a side effect, um, like additional result, we were also able to, um, to say something about the Taylor expansion for standard MLPs. So uh, if we have F being a neural network, then the rth order term is of order um, one over n to the r minus one uh, for piecewise linear activations. Uh, 
which was previously postulated to be one over n and has been shown uh, by uh, the, the same group uh, for smooth activation. So we have one over n. Uh, so we have uh, a different behavior between uh, the two cases, which I think is interesting and requires more uh, study, I think. Um, so I will uh, I will summarize. So so uh, the first part uh, discusses that hyper networks are probably suitable for presenting high order functions. So we have this uh, effectiveness in in representing high order functions. Uh, we also see that training a hyper network is a hard task. Uh, it requires a proper initialization and G should be shallow. Um, and uh, we, we also suggest a simple and useful method for initializing uh, hyper networks, which is in the second paper. Um, and I think it might be interesting to integrate the width of G in the analysis as well. Um, there is an additional setting uh, where uh, the input of, of F is uh, is being trained as well using SGD. So in a case where we don't have uh, the per task representation X and we, we don't analyze this case, I think it might be interesting uh, to study as, as well. Um, so I'll stop here. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, so what is the theoretical result exactly about the shallow? Why, why do you need G to be shallow? The, you, you just show that if G is not shallow, then the NTK approximation fa fails, right? This is... Yes. So but, you need to have the, um, the, the classic uh, convex optimization that we, we have uh, with standard neural networks. So basically what this means, if, if G is not shallow, then the dynamics might be different than the AT, NTK, but I mean. Um, yeah, but like you don't have the, the classic guarantee for convergence to, uh, to the global minima as you have with, uh, with the, um, the standard neural networks. I mean, it, it can be um, a different, it might be better optimization dynamics due to that, but as we show experimentally, this is not the case. Okay, okay any more questions? Okay, so thank you, Tomer. Thank you very for much. Great talk. Thank you. And uh, see you all next week. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you.